That's right. We're having major sex. You want burgers? Hot dogs? Some chicken? And ribs? Yeah! How's your quarantine going? It's going all right. Uh, I'm going to work still, thankfully. I mean, even though they're threatening to furlough most of us. What? That's, yeah. You didn't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, they're getting they're getting a little scary with it, but I don't think it's going to happen. So it's all good. I think. I don't know. Either way, you know what? We're just going to tell tell the bill people to just take a fucking hike. I don't know. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. What else are we going to do? Anyway. <laughs> We're going to sign you up for unemployment. <laughs> yes. Oh, good Lord. You just scared the crap out of me. You know what's great? This puppy. Is that we're not alone in the unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And then we have a puppy. We do. We are podcasting with a puppy tonight because Brittany surprised me with a puppy. There's it. There it is. Uh, <laughs> we are podcasting with a puppy. <laughs> sorry if you hear little cries. Yes, you might hear a puppy from time to time. I'm sorry. Welcome to Nigh the Horror File. I'm Lee, and that over there is my beautiful wife, Brittany. Hi. And uh, normally we take a horror movie and have Brittany watch it, but uh, this month it's trauma month, so if you're just joining us, go back and listen to our past episodes. They've been great so far. I've I've been having a blast. <laughs> How about you? I have too, actually. Yeah. Um, What did we watch this week? Tromeo and Juliet. I almost said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you almost say? Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Do you like Shakespeare? Not really. You're not a big fan of Shakespeare? No. I love Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Loved it in high school. Loved it even more when I got out of high school and read the actual text. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, and I'll explain that in a little bit, but uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I love I love it all. Tromeo and Juliet is a fateful abbot, more or less faithful <laughs> adaptation of Shakespeare's tragedy, only with a heaping amount of good old trauma, sexuality, violence, and the gore we love so much. Now, originally, the first draft of this was pinned in 1992, written by Kaufman and uh, trauma employees Andy Deemer and uh, Phil Revo. Now, it was all written in Shakespearean verse, and supposedly the Toxic Avenger would have played a side character. But the negative feedback from Michael Hurst and other trauma employees caused the idea to be scrapped. Um, enter James Gunn. Yes, that James Gunn of Marvel and now DC fame. Uh, now, Gunn was a newbie just starting out when he took a shot at the concept in uh, 1995. Gunn completely rewrote the script, uh, keeping some of the Shakespearean verse and uh, adding more darker and more obscene material. Uh, the original story just had Juliet as a stripper and Tromeo as a drug dealer. Uh -huh. uh, now, this was revised with additional material pinned by Lloyd, who threw in his own style of comedic elements, and the verse was also trimmed down, and that's how we got what we watched this week. Now, it's funny, but Lloyd wanted the entire film to be iambic pentameter. <laughs> oh. uh, but... <laughs> and most of the key scenes are, as we see, but uh, James Gunn thought that was way too much and just told Lloyd it was <laughs> while they were filming it. <laughs> so Lloyd had no idea that the whole thing was an iambic <laughs> pentameter. Uh, this is Lloyd's first trauma movie directed by himself. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is why this movie is important. Now, this is one of the least expensive trauma flicks shot in the summer of 1995 for $350,000. Normally, a trauma movie usually costs $500,000. That's where Lloyd likes to stick it to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Still super low budget for the kind of <laughs> movies, you know. And now, no one does the bard like trauma. And this is to date my favorite take on Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, the Leo version can go suck it. Um, <laughs> if we had a whole movie podcast, like just movies, I could go into why I don't like that version with Leonardo DiCaprio. But, you know, uh, so let's dive in to a little Shakespeare served up trauma style. Are you going to interrupt me? 
I don't know. Do you have more to say? I don't think so. Okay. Well, the movie starts... You know... (laughs) You know, as we've talked about in our past two Trauma Month episodes, uh, this film has one kick-ass soundtrack. Uh, A really good soundtrack at that. Um, I'd have to say my favorite. Right? And it's very reflective of the time. I mean, you got some sublime and stuff in there. Uh, The soundtrack's composed of alternative rock, punk, and a helping of metal. Uh, Most of the artists featured here lent their songs without pay in honor of Troma. Uh, I think I mentioned it in one of our past episodes. Troma is like a musician's movie studio. (laughs) A a lot of musicians love Troma. Um, I I think it was either uh, Super Chunk or Ass Ponies. (laughs) Yeah. That's a that's a band. Uh, But um, I was like, what? I believe one of them, uh, they wanted a check for nine dollars and ninety five cents from Troma just so they can hang it on their wall. Nine dollars and ninety nine or ninety five. Yeah, it's like ten bucks just so they can hang a check from Troma on their wall just because like that's how into it these people were. That's funny. Um, Now, you know, um, I said that their musicians love this movie, these movies and stuff. It's kind of like the bands. I don't know if you know these, but the band Suicide and the Damned, they're uh, they're widely loved bands, but not so much in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Well, the Damned sort of. I don't know. Maybe I think they're mainstream just because I love them. But (laughs) those are like musicians bands. It's it's almost like musicians are the only ones that get those bands. (laughs) I don't know how to explain it, but it's kind of like that. Same with Troma. For some reason, musicians flock towards Troma. Um, The general public may not get it, but I think us and the fans all kind of do. But (laughs) (laughs) okay, so I will turn the reins over to you for a moment. Are you sure about that? Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) So the movie starts off with a squirrel hanging from a noose uh, from like the the ceiling or whatever. And a a note saying uh, Montague sucks. And then we get Lemmy from Motorhead. From Motorhead. We're Motorhead and we like to rock and roll. (laughs) And he starts telling us. If he starts speaking in I am Pantamer, but he's telling us the story kind of of right, right. the cues versus the Capulets. Right. And like I said, this uh this movie is pretty much Romeo and Juliet. I mean, uh, with yeah. trauma thrown in there. Um right. and a and a nice ending. <laughs> but um, we'll get to that later. But yeah, it's it's more or less faithful. So uh what you have here is Lemmy being the narrator is right. what we got. Um, and then he just, it just goes through the cast of, of the movie yeah, and shows you little scenes from the movie. Yeah. It's like, it's like a play, you know, you're getting the cast list, you know, if you have a play program, you have the cast list, but, uh, the opening was inspired by Lloyd's favorite version of Romeo and Juliet, uh, the George Cooker version, uh, starring Leslie Howard and John Barrymore, which (laughs) they were both kind of old playing like teenagers, but (laughs) we'll get over that. Um, the film introduced itself in this manner. So, uh, if you go and look at that George Cooker version. Uh, it's like it's set up like this. Um, and that flick is super stylized with some great acting. Uh, they gave the cast cassettes of that film uh, to study while they were rehearsing for this film. So uh, they, they all studied that movie. Uh, right. So um, if you watch that version of Romeo and <laughs> Juliet, you will see direct inspirations <laughs> in this movie. Murray, who's Mercur- Mercutio. He, he looks like <laughs> like the version of Mercutio from that George Cooker version. Oh, okay. So, yeah. okay. so like I was saying, let me uh, or it's showing scenes of the movie and stuff. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of people getting shot. And <laughs> when I was first watching this, I was like, I, I'm so stupid. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was going to be some kind of old timey. Well, the way it's set up in the iambic pentameter and everything and the way it's in Shakespearean verse and everything, it does feel like a classic movie at first, right. even so, though it's Lemmy. <laughs> right. But I was like, oh, they're shooting each other. And I was like, oh. Yeah. Like uh, it shows scenes of the, of the, the feud between these two houses. Uh, <laughs> somebody gets shot in the dick. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, somebody else gets their brain ripped out of their skull, you know, and just 
Good nice. old trauma violence. Uh, somebody gets their ears ripped off. That was fun. Oh, I guess that's not part of the movie. It's just part. Of, uh, it's the before. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. while Lemmy's talking about two yeah. households divided. <laughs> I don't think he says it like that. I don't know. I can't do a Lemmy, but <laughs> I wish I could. Um, uh, Lemmy, speaking of which, uh, who I don't feel like I really need to explain why Lemmy kicks a lot of ass. To our listeners, I'm sure they know. If they listen to us, they know who Lemmy is. Right. It seems to – metal fans seem to flock to us. But um, uh, but he appeared in this film and gave music to Troma to use all for free just because he loved their movies. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> now, the things he wanted in return were Ooh. a bottle of whiskey and two of the Tromettes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say like a pack of cigarettes. No, no. And of course, since it's Lemmy, the Tromets went willingly. But <laughs> I would hope so. Well, it's Lemmy. Fuck. Oh <laughs> if I, I, I mean, if somebody wanted to pay for something in me for a Lemmy mixture, <laughs> let's get this over with. <laughs> anyway, but uh, now to pay a celebrity to, to be in your movie that uh, because I mean, make no doubts about it if Lemmy was huge you know so to get right. a celebrity of uh, even of that caliber you'd probably fork over a shit ton of movies uh small fortune but Lemmy had trauma classes <laughs> <laughs> so uh and Lemmy has always said or had always said uh, wow I think it's been two or three years since we Lemmy died um, he always said that uh, trauma was the rock and roll of movies. So, <laughs> I'd, I'd agree. Yeah, he I loves would definitely it. Definitely agree. Uh, he, you'll see. I mean, now not next week's movie, which we'll announce at the end. We go back to the eighties with that one, but you'll see moving forward in the movies. Uh, Lemmy plays more and more roles in these oh, okay. coming up. So I think in uh, uh, what is it? Return to Newcom High. He plays the president. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's great. That's awesome. Act one. <laughs> okay, I will tell you. <laughs> I did not specifically write like that they spoke iambic pentameter in this scene or this part or whatever. I think maybe in one part I did, but I didn't write it down for every single one of them. But ten to one, I'll probably point it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, but I did not write it that way. Yeah, yeah. So this act starts at some kind of like club yeah and there's a live band and the people there's people running there's just people running around all over the place this is where we meet sammy and sammy is juliet's cousin right. so it's sammy capulet and he sees someone making out with georgie which is his sister and he decides he needs to knock this guy out uh, that the band that's playing live here is a uh, thorn um, if any, I'd go look them up if you guys want to know more about them. But um, Thorn is the band; they're pretty good. Uh, now, Sammy here is played by someone you know, mm -hmm. uh, Sean Gunn, the brother of James Gunn. Right. Uh, Sean was in Gilmore Girls. That's <laughs> that's he where you know. Kurt. Yeah, that's where you know him from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, James tends to put uh, his brother in just about every movie he works on. So you'll see him pop up in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh. Uh, both of those, I think he's in another. I think he's in Endgame, Avengers or whatever, but um, he pops up in all those movies that he works up, including the upcoming Suicide Squad movie that James Gunn is doing to wa help wash the taste of that last one out of our, <laughs> out of our mouth. We'll see about that. <laughs> I, I think, know. you know, now people tout uh, Joss Whedon as being this god of oh, writing and stuff like that but yeah. I, I i absolutely cannot stand joss whedon the only thing good he's ever done is firefly and buffy that's it <laughs> i'm not a fan of joss whedon it's kind of a monster but you know i don't need to go into that but i think honestly james gunn is 10 times better than joss whedon i like james gunn and they're working in the same kind of capacity here with uh comic book heroes but i i really love james gunn <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fuck you, Josh Whedon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the Big Big Theory. Did you know that? Who? Uh, James Gunn. No. Josh Whedon. Uh huh. Yeah, still fuck him. Okay. <laughs> I just thought I'd tell you. <laughs> so Georgie is pissed, and it, Sammy. <laughs> Sammy's like rubbing all over her and saying that he has meth and he wants to snort it with her, 
and that he wants to fuck her. And she's just like, yeah. you don't do that with your sister, Sammy. <laughs> and he even like grabs her boobs and shit. Then he tells her that incest is better than the cues. <laughs> and he was like, if I see the cues tonight, this is what I'm going to do. And he just starts knocking people out with this like <laughs> sock lock thing that he has. Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> but Sammy is a character, man. I love his character. Oh, yeah. Just- <laughs> fucking crazy but uh this kind of plays into the ending of our film <laughs> the incest angle here oh yes yeah. i didn't even think yeah, about that. yeah <laughs> yes so it goes to a scene um at a body piercing tattoo parlor place or whatever mm-hmm. and this woman is getting her nipples pierced by benny which is tromeo's cousin tromeo and his best friend murray are there and they're talking about the capulets and they're mad at them or whatever yeah yeah and i I can't even understand what they're saying because i'm watching this woman get her fucking nipple pierced i was like they're not going to show this i don't they're not going to show this i don't think it was a real nipple piercing but it looked good (laughs) i've seen a nipple get pierced and that i would have screamed but uh I think I would have screamed and I wanted to get my nipples for for a long time and I'm like nope not doing it there's more blood than what you see oh I know that there's a bit more blood a bit more not not a ton but uh (laughs) but okay so let me explain a little bit about Romeo and Juliet Uh, you said you don't like Shakespeare have you ever read that the real version not the high school version because I'll get into why um shakespeare is comparable to lloyd <laughs> but um no i haven't even seen a romeo and juliet movie oh, really other than maybe what they showed in school but i don't remember them showing that in school i know they showed us the olivia hussey version a lot which is it's okay it's still mushy but um but i'm trying to think of what like modern ish movies may have been based on that but the only thing you've seen that's based on Shakespeare is a uh, Taming Thing. of the Shrew, which is Ten Things I Hate About You. Yeah. Which I told you in that movie, if you certain there are certain scenes in that movie that they do talk in the amic <laughs> pentameter. Um it's not as noticeable as this. Right. But uh okay. So in Ro- uh, Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. there's a big theme about old age versus youth. Okay. This movie takes it, runs with it. Like uh, this scene here is setting up uh, that kind of theme, which is, okay, it's like a subtle theme that uh, the baby boomer generation has manipulated the world to suit its own desires. You know, Uh, I'm probably going to piss off a lot of people. (laughs) Actually, I think our age base now of our listeners is like 17 to 35. (laughs) So that's okay. So, so we're good. We're good. We're with our people. right now. (laughs) So, well, okay. So, now these are the same people that shouted love and freedom in the 60s mind you uh, so uh they've given into this blind elitism nowadays that is showering us with coolness over feelings this was especially true in the 90s uh, if you think back then right um they literally were feeding off the younger generations as they are today. Uh, we live in a world where we are told to consume and be good little shoppers. And then our opinions and feelings are stupid <laughs> yes. and we should just shut up and try to get where they are in the world. But at the same time, they're blocking us off from getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so they are metaphorically locking us inside of a glass box, which is literally shown later in the film. <laughs> it, it's a thing that, um, like I said, was especially prevalent in the 90s. Many of our generation from the 90s and stuff are just now figuring out who the fuck we are. Right. A lot of us still haven't figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out. But uh, but that theme plays throughout this entire movie. You know? Right. But, but again, it's done the trauma way, so it's not bashing you in the face <laughs> with it over and over again. Right. So back at the club, Murray's there now, and him and his friends – are laughing at Sammy because he's sitting on this girl and this girl wants nothing to do with him. And they start, I wrote, they're getting into a fuck you fight. And I was like, what? Oh, that's where they're going. Fuck you. No, fuck you. No, fuck you. No, fuck you. (laughs) And now this scene, you mentioned it was like a club, kind of looked like a club, kind of dance something. It was small. Yeah. Um, It was actually shot in a cyber cafe called at the at club <laughs> the at club yeah, remember it's the 90s oh like cyber cafes at yeah um oh man i i went to a cyber cafe a lot <laughs> but uh to anyway. look at porn 
no, no, to play Counter Strike. But you know, uh, a lot of my nerd friends will know what that is. Why are you looking at porn? No, you weren't allowed to look at porn. You got kicked out if you did, <laughs> and no pizza for you. <laughs> yeah, fatty, no pizza for you. <laughs> Sean Gunn and Valentine Meal, who plays Murray, uh, they were trained in stage combat. So they knew what they were doing during this little fight scene that's about to oh, develop. Stage combat. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It's to teach you how to not actually hit somebody while it's looking like you're hitting somebody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, so like wrestling. Yeah. And they were also. <laughs> I thought you were going to say <laughs> No, no, it's true. Yeah. Wrestling. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows wrestling is fake. It's just still fun to watch. <laughs> you can't tell people. <laughs> but okay so during this scene though val got carried away <laughs> and improvised a punch which sean didn't really expect uh -oh. and it hit him square in the face oh, no. broke his nose sean stayed oh, and no. acted for another eight hours with a broken nose oh my gosh um now there were some cuts that bothered you i noticed you you were like wait what they're at this club now like because it shows murray in the tattoo parlor and mm -hmm. there's no what you would call that to show how he got there would be an establishing shot. Oh, okay. And now, um, those kind of bothered you a little bit at first, but, uh, <laughs> now, uh, trauma isn't a fan <laughs> of the polished cinematic style. Okay. Uh, so if I, you, I caught on. Yeah. So if you recall <laughs> back in our, uh, Toxie episode, I mentioned how a character being a different bikini each time was probably on oh. purpose. It was probably just left. It was. <laughs> right. It kind of is. It, it's all through this movie, especially. Um, in fact, uh, the script supervisor was so upset by that, <laughs> by the, everyone's apathy for uh, whatever. Let's just get the movie done. Don't worry about it. Right. Just have fun. <laughs> she fucking quit. <laughs> I feel like that's something you would do, too. Yeah. She fucking quit. <laughs> I don't know. If it's a trauma movie, you got to know what you're going into. Come on. <laughs> like, Come on. Yeah, um, but you like things done a certain way. Well, you know, it sounds like I'm saying Lloyd's like a lazy guy or something like that. He's not. He runs a really tight ship. Lloyd is awesome. <laughs> like, uh, and now I've never talked to a Hollywood or a movie producer or anybody in his – I mean, yeah, he's over trauma. But still, you know, he's making movies and stuff. So when we chatted on the phone for our interview, which I st we're still trying to transcribe everybody. We had a tech problem. If somebody knows how to transcribe yes, if this. If you want to help us out, this would be great because it is very hard. But uh, our <laughs> tech problem happened and it didn't record right. So there's a lot of garble. And I can't put that out in an episode. That's not right. fair. Uh, so we're transcribing it, and I'm going to make a whole thing about it on our uh, website. But, so we'll let you know when that's coming. But when I was talking to him on the phone, he has the ability to make you feel like you're important. Oh, yeah. Like that, and he's genuine. Like he'll, he'll just sit there and talk to you and stuff like you're, you're a friend. It, it was oh, cool. Right. I had a great time. But <laughs> so he's not lazy. <laughs> right. It's just uh, – he likes to focus more on getting the action and getting that energy and stuff on camera instead of having to reset and take like multiple takes of stuff just to get it right. Right. He's not into that. That takes more money, more time. Exactly. Yeah. This scene is hilarious to me. Tromeo goes to talk to his dad and he's – his dad's laying on the ground. <laughs> he's fucking drunk as drunk can be and he's just like rolling around and he keeps farting. Like, <laughs> after every sentence, he's like, Tromeo, Tromeo, we're far there, Tromeo. <laughs> he falls over. <laughs> yeah, that's our in introduction to Murray Q. <laughs> no, not Murray. Oh, I'm sorry. Monty. Monty Q. My Monty bad. Q, uh, yes. I forget this actor's name, but they said he he's the nicest motherfucker on the set. <laughs> and he loved ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> just, he loved taking the PAs out for ice cream and stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to say that. <laughs> he loved ice cream. Don't, I don't know why I know stuff. <laughs> okay. I just do, and I feel like I have to vomit it out for everybody. <laughs> okay. So, back at the club, Murray and Sammy are still fighting, and now they're, like, physically fighting. Yeah. And... They fight their way into this office and Murray cuts off with one of those really big like it's paper, paper cutter, cutter yeah. things cuts off the tip of two of Sammy's fingers. Well, he cuts the whole things off, really. 
Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like half of his fingers. <laughs> but what's funny about this is the people that were in the in that office were fucking well they're about to fuck and she was like she was saying something about yeah i like your fingers and then yeah. he comes in there he gets his fingers cut off and the guy in there is like you need to clean this up i'm gonna get fired you need to clean this up i was like dude just got his fingers cut up cut off and you want him to clean up your desk like okay but it was a funny scene yeah now um another point where they just leave stuff in sometimes if you look you can see the special effects guy pulling the fake hand back from the cutter oh dang <laughs> so it's just more examples of that and um like i said it, it's a let's get the film made not dwell you know on on and, and i think that's what separates uh an auteur filmmaker from a traditional filmmaker now uh, i'll explain what an auteur I was filmmaker like, is uh... it's so it well, okay, to simplify it, you can watch one of these directors' movies and know it's their movie. Okay, yeah, Just yeah, by yeah. the style. Yeah. Like, uh, you know a Tarantino movie yeah. from a fucking not. Michael Bay movie. <laughs> like, like, and not Tarantino. And Michael Bay especially. You know a Michael Bay movie. He's mm -hmm. a auteur. Even and though Shyamalan. Yeah, so, well, <laughs> there's a twist. <laughs> there doesn't need to be a twist. Fuck that guy. The trees don't need to kill people. He's a one hit wonder that keeps promising something and then we all fall for it and then we get Why have we not said the biggest one of all? Splice? No. No. My brain is fried now. Stephen King. Stephen King doesn't make movies. <laughs> People adapt his stuff into movies. He's only directed a uh, Maximum Overdrive, which we saw how that turned down. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we did yeah. talk about this. Okay, never mind then. Yeah. Well, I'm anyway, <laughs> that, that's the simple explanation of what a tour filmmaker is. Me. Right. But you can tell when it's a Lloyd Kaufman movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, now, uh, basically, if you want to be clinical uh, into the books and you want that in your movie mm – -hmm. Trauma is not for you. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not for you. <laughs> no. Uh, I always love Lloyd's quote about mainstream films being like baby food. You can live off of baby food, but it's really boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like honestly, by letting the audience see the seams in these films, uh, see the see the seams and the effects and make it, you know, it's it's like a torn edge. <laughs> like, right. There's a torn edge to these movies and letting us see that it kind of makes it into an interactive medium. It kind of like you're watching a movie get made and stuff like that. And you're having fun. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, you're right. That's why in one of the now movies, explain it. Yeah. That's yeah. why in one of the movies, they can show you a pregnant lady getting her fetus ripped out and you're still having a good time. I don't, <laughs> I, Xan, I don't know how he does it, but he does it. Still having a good time. I, I'm telling you, we saw a little kid get his head smashed in by a car. And we had a damn good time with that. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then Toxie was born. Exactly. So Tromeo calls his girlfriend. <laughs> and his girlfriend's name is Rosie. Yes. <laughs> and she is getting plowed by some other dude. <laughs> as she's on the phone with him. Uh -huh. And she... Was like, yeah, I'm going to go to the Capulet's uh, costume party tomorrow night. And the whole time she's moaning. <laughs> and then she's like, okay, I got to go because I had to come. <laughs> and hung up the phone. And he's just like, Tromeo's just like, ah, ah, ah. like nothing is going on. Poor Tromeo. Because <laughs> she's obviously getting yes. fucked. <laughs> got to go so I can come. <laughs> I gotta go so I can go. Oh, um, <laughs> the actor filling up Tromeo's girlfriend, Rosie, was <laughs> he was actually missing a finger. And you can see that in a later scene. And it's kind of ironic since we just saw someone's fingers being cut off. <laughs> there's so many fingers. Yeah, there's a lot of irony to this little side character. Say it again. Irony? Oh, God damn it. It's back. <laughs> it's back. If you're just joining us, I don't say iron right. <laughs> <laughs> iron? Iron. I don't. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> There's a lot of irony to this guy. Ah, oh, goddamn! I said it again. Now, 
Why do I do this to myself? Um, now, uh, Rosie is played by Jacqueline Tavares, who's featured in, uh, I believe it's either Pinhouse or Playboy Centerfold. <laughs> oh, I um, bet she was. Yeah, I think she was in uh, one of the Playboy uh, lingerie catalogs, which were a thing. Um, why do I know this? I'm not sure, but there you have it. Um, she was cast by Troma to be a contrast between Juliet. You know, you have <laughs> Rosie and Juliet. There's a big contrast. Oh, yeah. Juliet's more, uh, you know, Rosie is this sexed up, outwardly sexual woman who's getting mm. eaten out later on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> who She's not after true love or anything. <laughs> All the while, Juliet is more reserved and innocent and longs for true love. So right. It's a, it's a nice little contrast. But, yeah. And I didn't realize, and I don't, I was going to ask you this, and I guess now is a better okay. time than ever. Okay. But not watching a lot of Romeo and Juliet movies and stuff uh -huh. like that. Was Romeo poor and Juliet's family was rich and... They were both from affluential families, sort of. I believe Romeo's family... Now, I, I fuck, it's been a while since I read this. But um, I believe Romeo's family is slightly a little poorer. Okay, that's what yeah. I was wondering. Because in this movie... It, Tromeo's Tromeo and Tromeo's father and all that, yeah. they're poor. Right. Their right. family is the poor. Capulets are the ones that are yeah. that have all the money. I, I you know, I gotta go back and read that. It's been a while. Like if you you can't just sit down and read Shakespeare all the time. <laughs> but I'll go back and read that and see what that's about. But I think they were on the same level. It's just there's a lifelong feud between the two families. Right. But in this one, you could definitely tell that yeah, oh, the yeah, cues yeah. were poor. trash. Yeah, the yeah. cues are considered the trashy bunch. Yeah. Um, there's like because... an Aladdin thing going on there. <laughs> but um, why did I – only on Night of the Horror File will you get a comparison between Tromeo and Juliet and Aladdin. <laughs> Disney cartoon. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. Um, Was there a genie? Uh, no. <laughs> there's no genie here. Dang it. So – as the cues do, they go to torture the Capulets. <laughs> so Benny and Murray go, and they wake up Cappy Capulet. I think, aside from Tromeo and Juliet, I think Benny and Murray are my favorite characters. <laughs> in this. They're pretty great. Yeah, um, uh, Cappy though, uh, <laughs> Cappy Capulet. I'm sorry, <laughs> yes. um, Cappy is played by William Bexwith. Um, he, he's credited as uh, Maximilian Sean. Uh, who uh, he's actually a, a trained Shakespearean actor on stage and stuff like that. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's just funny because he's in this movie. And <laughs> oh, I know, I know. <laughs> now he delivers his lines with that Shakespearean gusto the entire movie. Yes. Even though I will get to why he's a piece of shit, but um, he had auditioned and almost got the part of the evil one in Sergeant Kabuki Man in NYPD, which uh. We might cover at the end of the month. I don't know. Oh, my God. We'll find out at the end of the episode. But at the time, he had to play a part in a production of Othello, another Shakespearean play. Um, so he couldn't be in Kabuki Man. Now, they had an actor cast it as Cappy, and they even started filming with the guy. But he kept dicking him around. Uh, changing his schedule and manipulating trauma like he was a big deal actor, you know. Oh, well, I I got this going on now, so you'll have to change the shooting dates to this. And, and you know, trauma isn't a big studio. They can't fucking cater to you. Right. <laughs> like, that's one of the things you got to remember. You know, I keep telling people if you live near the area when all this is over and you want to get a start somewhere, get your foot in the door, go to trauma. You got to keep in mind, you're going to have to adapt to whatever schedule they got going. Right. You're going to have to kind of dedicate some of your life to that <laughs> at the time. It might only be two weeks, but you're still going to have to dedicate it. Can you do that? Can you dedicate like six months there? <sighs> We'd have to live in a really bad apartment. But <laughs> I'm talking about you. Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, oh, they can't you're see trying me to get waving. rid of me. <laughs> they can't see me waving Brittany's at you. trying to get rid of me. Um, <laughs> I've been quarantined in this house too just long. show up at Troma Studios. Can I sleep on the couch? <laughs> my wife kicked me out. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> Use my body. Shoot Use me it. out of a cannon. Oh, yeah. That's what you said the other yeah, day. <laughs> yeah, go watch. Go listen to that episode. Uh, I think it was last week's episode. <laughs> but anyway, like I said, he was dicking him around. And uh, Troma... Or, you know, 
Lloyd's a nice guy. So he was kind of thinking about kowtowing down to him, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, just working with him. But James Gunn and Andrew Weiner went to, yes, his last name's Weiner, went to Lloyd. It's not Weiner. No, it's Weiner. Maybe I'm, maybe it's Weiner. I'm sorry, Andrew, (laughs) if you're out there. I think it's Weiner. Might be Weiner. I think it's But they went to Lloyd and basically said, you know, we got to dump this guy. He's he's fucking us around. (laughs) He's got to go. So they found Sean. And he was on the set the morning after he was signed up. He had Dang. learned his lines and whatever. It was ready to go. Dang. So he, they were lucky they got Sean. Um, and even though he plays the worst piece of shit in this movie, he's fucking fantastic. At oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> he's a really good villain. Oh, yeah. Especially with that, that gusto he has. <laughs> like, there's several times, which we won't. We won't go into it, but there's several times where he recites lines from a different Shakespeare play, like Hamlet. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> and then he stops and tells you what verse and stuff that is and kind of brushes his hair back. Oh, it's, yes. Oh, it's fucking yes. great. So, Cappy, <laughs> he's mad. Get me my bow. He's mad that they woke him up. So he shoots his little explosive arrow at them yeah he has exploding arrows <laughs> you know <laughs> then he starts to beat up his wife yes for no reason <laughs> julian's mom he just starts beating her <laughs> like, she okay. said something and it was it was really stupid and he just starts beating her up but this is um where he starts hitting her and we and we go to juliet in a minute and you'll explain that mm-hmm. but um you still hear it it's like a really creepy scene. Yeah, yeah. Because then <laughs> she's tuning it out, <laughs> right? She then it cuts to Juliet, um, playing her guitar, and you can still still hear them fighting yes. or whatever. And then Ness comes in, and Ness is the Capulet's cook, right? And I assume she lives there. Yeah. Now in the real Romeo and Juliet play, um. It's the nurse and the nurse oh. doesn't really have as big. She doesn't fuck Julie. <laughs> as she does in this, but <laughs> which I think we all wanted her to, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, and uh, now the, the nurse rats them out at the end and stuff. Oh, so okay. it's still basically faithful to what that character is. Yeah. So she comes in and they're kind of talking about, Cappy and what's her name fighting or whatever. Mm. Juliet starts talking about how she's supposed to marry the meat king or whatever they call it. <laughs> the king of meat. <laughs> um, He's a a butcher yes. at a meat shop and mm-hmm. I guess his dad owns the meat shop so he's going to inherit it and have lots of money. And her and Ness just start making out. Right. Now, okay, here's something off the wall and <laughs> not at all really related to the scene. But Taoism is a huge part of Lloyd's filmmaking. We kind of explained that in uh, Toxie where I said, you know, there's the dual nature of Toxie. Lloyd loves playing with that. Like, um, and it's almost like represented in this movie too. You got the dualism, uh, the yin and yang. Uh, so this is dualist nature. It, it's present. Oh, fuck. I already said that. Uh, like the yin and yang, basically. Um, <laughs> Ness is sad, but uh, she also acts as a foil for Juliet. So she's good and bad at the same time. Oh, you know, it's right. that kind right. of dualist thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, she, but yeah, she acts as a foil later on as this relationship blooms and stuff, you know, as we see. She wants Juliet to herself in this movie. Yeah. However, I think in the play, it's just, she just, I can't remember. Okay. Stop talking. <laughs> so this is like a back and forth kind of scene thing. So we go from Ness and Juliet making out to Tromeo and he puts on porn on this old ass computer. Puts a CD ROM. A CD. Porn. <laughs> Of porn in this computer, and he gets his lube ready. Playboy used to actually put out CD ROMs. Like, oh my god! I don't know, like this. I, mean, I but, don't think so. Uh, but they used to put out porn 
<laughs> CD ROMs. <laughs> God damn. How, how long has it been since you said CD ROM? Well, I don't say CD ROM. I said CD. Oh, I really? never in always my called life it CD ROM. See, I always called it CD ROM if it had to do with a computer. And then a CD. If it... No, it's just a CD. You want to know something really annoying? No. One of my friends used to call it a compact disc. He used to say the whole thing. Just bug the shit out of me. I don't know why. Do they have that on compact disc? It's like, fuck you, dude. Come on. <laughs> okay, but CD-ROM. You can't say anything when you're the guy that says CD-ROM. I was saying it for computer discs. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> but the music disc can go in the CD-ROM player, too. Yeah? Yeah? All right. Let's move on. <laughs> so they're all CD-ROMs. Okay. So that means that they're all CDs. Okay, let's not rag on old school Lee. <laughs> so you can on. talk shit about this guy over here. He was calling it a talk... compact. Anyway. <laughs> he was calling it the correct words. Let's move back to Tromeo masturbating, please. Oh my gosh. Anyway. Which Will Keenan is fantastic in this movie. Sorry, I'm butting in. He's a great actor. Anyway. It cuts back to Juliet and Nest. And Juliet tells Nest that when she touches her, she thinks about men. Now, Ness is played by the amazing Debbie Rashawn, who was actually a year younger than Jane Jensen, who plays Juliet here. Mm. And now lots of people uh, thought these tattoos that uh, Debbie has uh, and piercings were real, but uh, they were all fake except for one on her belly button, which she got pierced before shooting just to see what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie Rashawn's awesome. But um, the mouth piercings she has kept falling out during the scene <laughs> while they're making out. Um, Ness is, like I said, she's sort of a sad character. Uh, she loves Juliet, but Juliet doesn't feel for her. Ness is kind of just a fuck buddy. Right. You know, uh, like she says, you know, I think of men. When you <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, now, Debbie Rashawn. Uh, was also a Tromet, and uh, she's had a great career in some awesome flicks. Uh, she has over like 200-something credits to her name, so go check out her movies. They're, they're uh -huh. great. Many of them came through Troma. In fact, she has a, a mockumentary out. <laughs> What's a mockumentary? It's like a documenta documentary, but kind of it's kind of fake. Oh, okay. It's hard to explain. We'll, we'll yeah. get to those eventually. Okay. So back to Tromeo. <laughs> The porn that he's watching is very weird because it's like, you can choose this or you can choose marriage. If you want shit and piss. Oh, that's what it was. You want Kate or something like that. <laughs> then it was like, if you want to be in love or something yeah, like that, you choose this one. love. And he chooses the true love one and it's all about getting married and the woman in the video, it's like, I love you. I love you. And he's like, I love you. I love you. <laughs> getting off to that. And, and Romeo or Tromeo, sorry, uh, Tromeo and Juliet are basically doing the same things here, just in different ways. Oh, is, yeah. Uh, they both want that. true love, but this is what they got right now. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this, is is what, what this is how I we're going to handle this. <laughs> I'm not a lesbian. I just need to masturbate. Yeah. And you help me with that. I think a lot of people can relate. Um, <laughs> Uh, I love how the, the title of the thing he puts in is Shakespeare Sex Interactive. <laughs> oh, I didn't check yeah, that. It has Shakespeare picture on it. So, okay. So while Troma and Lloyd always loved Shakespeare, uh, in The Toxic Avenger Part 2, there is actually a Shakespeare scene <laughs> as well as other films. There's little hints here and there. A trauma hadn't really played around with romance. Uh, Lloyd and Michael Hurst were tired of the mushy adaptations, you know. Same here, <laughs> that we're floating around. Uh, every adaptation of Romeo and Juliet tends to be kind of boring and vanilla. That's my only complaint. Even the Olivia Hussey one isn't super interesting. It's good for an acting. If you want to watch some good acting, go see that. Oh, and the George <laughs> Cooker version. That one's fantastic for acting and stuff like that. Awesome acting. It's a little different than what some people are used to, which is kind of nice. But, but... Even that fucking Leonardo DiCaprio flick that I keep going on about <laughs> that came out, I think, the year before this, it doesn't truly grasp Shakespeare's impact he had on audiences during his time. You know, at one point, Shakespeare's or plays in general were banned in London. And luckily, the Globe Theater 
where Shakespeare put on his plays was located outside the walls. Uh, mm. This is my favorite adaptation because I believe it's even truer to the material than the other ones. <laughs> right. Shakespeare was not above dirty jokes. <laughs> yeah, by right. today's standards, it's it's tame. But many of his plays, if you read them, if if you're remembering Shakespeare from school, forget about that. You need to go find the un, uh, like unaltered versions of Shakespeare because, like in school, I remember our Shakespeare plays, like we read, were it seemed like they jumped around a lot, and I knew kind of something was off because you would have the balcony scene and then it would jump to some other scene. And it's like, what is what? What happened in between? They oh, fucking- nothing. <laughs> Basically. Uh, but I, what really makes me laugh really hard <laughs> is that Shakespeare is now considered uh, the highest of highbrow, <laughs> you know, dignified and refined people recite Shakespeare all the time. You, you, <laughs> you know, like that's the kind of person who's like really into Shakespeare. Okay. Now, what they don't talk about. <laughs> Is if you read his work, it also contains fart jokes. Like this scene from A Comedy of Errors. A man may break a word with you, sire. And words are but wind. Aye, and break it in your face. So he break it not behind. <laughs> That's a fart joke in Shakespearean. Oh, is it? It is. Think about it for a minute. A man may break a word with you. But you don't want him break. It's basically he's going to shit on you when you turn. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, do you have this scene of butt sex? <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, oh, she would open us, and thou a poppin pear. Okay, now let me explain this one. Now Mercutio, Mercutio, sorry, has just told Romeo that he should find a girl who's like a medlar fruit, commonly known as an open arse at, at the time. And by telling Romeo to be a popper in a pair, he's basically telling Romeo to open his mind to new experiences and to get a girl who likes it in the back door. <laughs> Are you sure? I could teach a Shakespeare class. <laughs> and then you have oral sex. Mm, now, this favorite. one's a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. This <laughs> one's a little bit more on the nose. Um, Lance. Well, the best is she has no teeth to bite. Now, taken out of concept, but if you listen to the conversation, they're happy. It, it, that's basically upfront about blowjobs. <laughs> Are you sure, though? I'm very sure. You have got to go. Just do a Google search of Shakespeare dirty jokes because he loaded them in there. It's just you didn't oh, get to read them. He loaded them in he, there? Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> no joke. Now, those are just a few examples, but it lets you know that Shakespeare would have probably dug this adaptation of his play. And like the very end of this movie, he very much probably would have found it fucking hilarious because <laughs> this movie ends with Shakespeare just busting out laughing. Um, Hell, his poem Venus and Adonis was all about folks getting it on. That whole fucking poem is about fucking. <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone says something, and I quote, about going down where the pleasant fountains lie. <laughs> Shakespeare was a dirty motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, he had a penis, right? Right. Well, you know, <laughs> well, it, and the thing was, Shakespeare didn't just put on plays for the, the nobles and stuff like that, as a lot of people would have you think. He was playing to the crowds, all the crowds. That's how he made a living back then. Nobody really made a living off of doing theater in those days. Really? Yeah. I'm not even joking. The ones that did were that good at it. And Shakespeare was that good. He was, Like I said, he wasn't revered in his day as he is now. I mean, we consider Shakespeare, like I said, <laughs> like uh, we just saw like a cooking show where they did Shakespeare stuff. <laughs> and that's how revered he is now. But – but Shakespeare was playing with pop culture. He was making plays about pop culture and stuff and playing to the the lower, the common people as well as uh, the nobles. That's how he made that. That's how he made a good amount of money to keep him going. You know? So uh, enough with the boring shit. <laughs> we see Juliet and Nessa's boobs. Yeah, boobies. And they start to finger bang. An absolutely necessary scene. Yes, I agree. 
Actually, yes, this is more necessary than the. N- we'll get <laughs> we'll to talk it. about we that. Will get to uh, it. So this kind of plays on the theme I, I mentioned earlier about youth versus old age and stuff like that. But it, it's also playing with uh, how young people have a hard time expressing outwardly how they're feeling. Do you think anywhere else, anywhere else is <laughs> reading into these trauma movies like I am? <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I touched on, pun intended, on how trauma... <laughs> How Troma tends to have musicians in their female roles. I believe I did that on the Artoxy episode. Uh, Jane Jensen, who plays Juliet, has some great music out there, and you can find it on Spotify. She's actually shared the stage with bands like your favorite, Green Day. Uh, she's been on stage with Porno for, or, you know, opened and stuff like that for Porno for Pyros, Bad Religion, and tons more. It's good stuff. In fact, Electric Chair off her Dolls Rock album is fantastic. <laughs> Nice. It's good stuff. Nice. Nice. She's also very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Just get that out of the way. Boobs. <laughs> anyway, um, Murray and Benny are walking up to Tromeo's apartment, or what? I think they all share an apartment, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But they're walking up to that, and they're talking about how Cappy and Monty used to be business parker partners in. Silky Films, which is a porno company. Uh, they don't say it's a porno company, but we'll get to that in a minute. But it is. Uh, oh, we'll get to it now. <laughs> and uh, Cappy took everything from Monty, and then Cappy stole Monty's wife. Tromeo does not know anything about any yeah. of it. And, uh, blah, blah, blah. and Murray tells Benny, don't, don't tell Tromeo. He right, right. Know. Now these scenes where they show because we start seeing flashbacks of, of kind of like what films. happened, silky films and Monty running the projector, and people having sex, yeah, in bowling alley. Now these scenes were uh, scenes from the first turn on that raunchy comedy I keep mentioning in our trauma episodes. Um, it's from trauma's early days. Go go back and watch uh, the first turn on and uh, squeeze play and all all those uh, raunchy comedies they did. They're great. Now those uh, editing rooms you see them working in. Those are the actual trauma editing rooms. Uh, you know what's cool is the – and nobody's going to fucking care about this. But uh, the camera Monty is holding is uh, the IMO camera. Uh, it's a small little camera uh, that took about a roll of 35-millimeter uh, film. And uh, it was used by Brendan Flint, the director of photography. Now, he'd use this, the IMO camera, to do crash filming. That's where – you can use it to uh, do really good point-of-view shots. And you can just run into shit with it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now you get a good example of that when Sammy meets fire hydrant later. (laughs) But, uh, (laughs) but yeah, that's the IMO camera. Now, Stephen Blackheart plays Benny who aside from Murray is my favorite (laughs) supporting character. Like I said, (laughs) he stars in another movie called rockabilly vampire, which I love and uh, we need to cover it, but you know, maybe another trauma month, but Stephen, also was trained in Shakespeare, and he does a fucking great job. I, I think that's why I like him. These are good actors in this movie. Oh, yeah. Um, he shows up in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies as well because he's a friend with James Gunn. I was Gunn. about to say maybe yeah, he's – they're friends. Yeah. So Juliet's having a dream. <laughs> okay. First of all, we need to talk about this scene. Where the fuck have I seen this scene before? I don't know. Okay. You were like, I've seen this. And I was like, how? Because I've never watched Tromeo and Juliet with you before we did this. Yeah. And so that was confusing for me. I was like, where have you seen this? I have no idea. That's wild. But you were like, I've seen this. (laughs) This I know I've seen this scene before. Because you even were like, his penis is fucked up, isn't it? I was like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because I've seen this before. (laughs) Where have I seen this? I don't know. A GIF? Maybe. You may have saw it online. That Uh, GIF is floating around. (laughs) Anyway, so Juliet's having this dream. (laughs) She's in a pool with all these flowers, and this, uh, like, macho, ripped-up guy comes up, and um, they start to make out. And his dick comes out of his pants, and it's this monster. (laughs) And I'm not talking about, like, oh, he's got a big dick. No, it's a literal monster with teeth. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) 
And then she wakes up screaming. And her dad comes in. So Cappy comes in. And he is pissed. Because he's like, I've told you about waking me up screaming. And he said, next time she does that, he's going to send her to her timeout room. And he is super creepy. Yeah, because he's like pulling up her uh, her curly nine and leaving your sex toys out again. <laughs> yes. <It's> like, <laughs> and he's like talking to her, you know creepy sexually yeah guy. he's really scuzzy it's really gross i think he's the grossest character in a trauma movie i've ever seen and we've seen <laughs> we've seen all of these things of, we just saw a monster penis and the, the grossest part about this scene the dad. was the dad but that's a testament to sean's acting man he's good oh yeah <laughs> he sells this character now lloyd had studied shakespeare at yale and he said that it's a little known fact that as shakespeare lay dying on his deathbed he expressed that he wanted to go back and rewrite romeo and juliet to include a giant penis monster okay now lloyd's great at delivering what? jokes <laughs> in a matter of fact way and that's just one of his jokes that he tells he has a way and I, I feel like i've done it on the show where he'll be talking deadpan to you and he'll slip a joke in to where you're like wait what and he'll just keep going though without stopping it's great um <laughs> But but yeah, that's just one of the jokes he tells on one of the commentaries. It's fucking amazing because he had me going for a minute because he's <laughs> right. yeah, he has he keeps you going. You're he's like, great at wait, that. What? Yeah. Um but yeah, you get Juliet's dad being really, really fucking sexually creepy towards her. And I I swear to God, that's the grossest part. <laughs> it is is her dad. It is for sure. So Sammy and Sammy, Cappy, and Monty are at the police station. They're talking to this detective, and he wants he wants Sammy to tell him who, like, cut his fingers off or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And he's not telling nothing. He's like, whatever. The detective's like tired of the cues and the capulets yeah. bullshit, <laughs> and all he can do is shove donuts in his face. <laughs> There's a lot of eating. With whenever the cops are there, somebody's eating donuts, and they're all fucking eating at the end of this movie. And I still donuts. don't know what that. I still don't know that that's a reference. To. Cops eat donuts. I guess. Anyway, <laughs> I was like, "What?" So they all leave, and Monty goes to get in the car that Benny is driving, and Cappy and Sammy like chase him down. And they're yelling at him while he's in the car. And Sammy puts his head in the window just enough. And Benny rolls the window up. So his face is like sideways. I'm moving my head like you guys can see. And his face is stuck between the door frame and the window. And he's just hanging out of the car. And Benny just fucking guns it. it. And he he's going down the street. And Sammy is just hanging on like trying to run with him. <laughs> but he's going so fast and he speeds down this road I have to explain this just because it's so funny to me Um, I usually don't go into a whole lot of detail but this scene was really funny so there's a little girl with her dad I assume her dad Yeah. and he's teaching her about the road is not safe but the sidewalk is yeah. but if she needs to cross the road like she's got to look both ways blah 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 <laughs> yeah. And she's like, so it's safe to cross the road. And he looks around and he's like, yeah, it's safe to cross the road. So she goes to cross the road and here comes Benny and hits him on the fucking sidewalk. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was just really funny to me. <laughs> now, this is uh, Neil Ruddy, who's the special effects and explosive person in this movie that gets, <laughs> gets hit by the car here. The young girl was just the daughter of a fan who came to help <laughs> help out with the shoot. Um uh, like I said, up next is that IMO camera I told you about. But um, <laughs> of course, the whole time you're seeing the action take place from inside the car, the car wasn't actually moving, just like in Toxie. Oh, yeah. They have the shaking and stuff. But they also do a, a, a little effect here where they where they use light and shadows to make it look like the car is moving. Because if you look at the actor's faces, there's still shadows moving and stuff. So a really oh, genius little cool. technique here. Um but on the outside, it's just a car rigged up with a stuntman. <laughs> nice. 
So Benny punches Sammy out of the window and he hits this fire hydrant and his skin is like coming off and he's like trying to put it back on his head. Oh, I felt so bad for Sammy <laughs> in this moment. That's because Sean Gunn, he does an awesome job here. Yes. Like, with this cartoon character that he's been given. <laughs> uh, but he does an awesome job reacting to his brains falling out stuff, yes. His skin all hanging. Um, the brains were actually, and this is a good trick for you guys who do uh, indie films and stuff like that. Uh, you can make some really good looking gore with toilet paper and Cairo syrup. Uh, Cairo syrup blood. <laughs> nice. Uh, you just mix that together. And that's how they get this like sinewy like gross brain matter kind of shit Ugh. act two act two <laughs> that's more how they say it, yeah lemme i fucking love lemme <laughs> so murray and tromeo are gonna go to the capulet's costume party because rosie was invited so she invited them and tromeo is dressed as a cow <laughs> I don't know what Murray was dressed as. A virus? I don't know. Kidding. He looked like a bug. Yeah, he <laughs> He's did like look a blue like a bug. bug kind of thing. Then we see Juliet and she's w walking to Meat World because she's going to pick up London, her future husband. Yes, we'll get to him. But uh, <laughs> He's a character. Yeah. So you may have noticed a trend with Meat in trauma films. Um, most all of trauma, including Lloyd himself, are either vegan or vegetarian. Oh. Uh, they don't believe in eating meat, and they are pro-animal rights, which is commendable with the amount of animal death we've seen on screen with trauma movies. I think, like <laughs> Lloyd puts it, uh, we you know we're okay with killing them, but you know we don't eat them. <laughs> right. But but you'll notice Meat World is a little bit more than ominous. <laughs> Uh, Juliet herself, we find out, is a vegetarian in this scene, um, and we've talked we've talked about doing that, going vegetarian. Right. So we've been discussing that. Maybe after quarantine, because all we got right now is meat. So I don't, I don't know how we're gonna pull. We we couldn't pull that off. I think we have like bell peppers and onions. So if you want to live on those for the next month, probably. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but I I think we're go we're gonna go vegetarian. We're gonna we're gonna see. Mostly for health reasons. I just feel like it's a healthier. I want to try that carrot bacon recipe that, that I cool. found, though. You, Brittany found a lady who cooked carrots into bacon. And I don't know which witchcraft she was using, but that it looked good. It, it was crunchy. Oh, and then she... Oh, you didn't see the video. She put it on a wrap. She made a, a, a BLT wrap with avocado. Oh, my God. See, I thought about like incorporating some vegan stuff into... Like staying away from flour. Vegans eat flour. No, no, you got to eat special vegan flour. I think. I don't think so. No? No. Well, I thought about staying away from flour too. <laughs> A lot of people use special flour because they're celiac or they oh, say that oh. they're celiac. I think but... this is just me trying to stay away from sweets somehow. <laughs> so you're saying that flour <laughs> yeah, is flour. Sweet... Flour is the devil. Well, a lot of his sweets are not vegan. Really? Yeah. Because they, a lot of them had like See, gelatin in I them, and gelatin's going, not vegan. Yeah, sugar, uh, is not vegan. I thought about going vegan, but the thing I would have a problem with is uh, the cheese and the eggs. Yeah, but they make a lot of replacers for those too. Do they? We need to go to like. Could we go vegan? Well, enough about our dietary habits. <laughs> Nobody cares about that. So in the meat world. <laughs> yeah. Um, they found this big, huge worm thing. It's like a giant maggot or something. <laughs> right? <laughs> and London's like, oh, just put it over there. We'll grind it up, make some hot dogs out of it. <laughs> okay. Again, a more commentary on meat. <laughs> right? And like I said earlier, Juliet's there to pick up Landy, Landy, London <laughs> for the party. And he's so excited about all this meat. He just keeps meat. talking about this meat and this loaf meat, raisin loaf that he's made. And Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God. I forgot about raisin loaf. <laughs> it's, it's like olive loaf, but it's not olives. It's raisins. It's raisins. <laughs> uh, this guy he's talking to at the start of the scene where he's telling him, uh, more fat on the meat. And the guy's like, that, that is good. <laughs> uh, that's the owner of this meat plant. And I'll explain uh, the meat plant later. But. 
Oh. And Juliet's like, um, I'm not trying that. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> and London starts to freak out. <laughs> and he digs this knife into his hand because he is so mad. <laughs> which is an ongoing theme for his character, which is creepy. Uh, now, London Arbuckle is played by Steve Givens. And if you notice, his character is way more cartoony than everybody else. Yes. It's good because it creates an awesome contrast between him and this uh, romance Tromeo and Juliet have. Uh, just like Ness, you know. Right. Um, it's a horrible life Juliet has to look forward to. To with Arbuckle, Raisin Loaf and all. <laughs> if you notice, Juliet's costumes are very reflective of the George Cooker version of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, these long flowy gowns and stuff, e even down to the bonnet she wears and the pastel colors she's always wearing. Yeah. It's, it's like that in that movie. But that meat theme... <laughs> <laughs> the meat theme we have in this movie is great. Oh my god! <laughs> like I said, they're not they're not beating you in the head with it. But not yet. Subtly there. <laughs> but by the way, do not look up how hot dogs are made. <laughs> Don't ever do that. No. <laughs> it's made me not eat regular hot dogs. <laughs> oh, I like a good charcoal hot dog. I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I saw you scarfing down some wieners in our lifetimes together. Well, that's what I do on the side for extra money. But, you know, let's, <laughs> let's move on. So we're at the party now. <laughs> and Murray is just disgusted for even being there. And he spits in the food. He hawks a big-ass loogie and, like, some guacamole or something and <laughs> swishes it around. <laughs> and Tromeo's looking for Rosie. And he finally finds her. And she's just being eaten out by some guy. With the missing finger. With a missing finger. <laughs> it's the same yep. guy from earlier we saw. He, like, he stands up, he uh. wipes his mouth, <laughs> it, and goes to shake Ju er, Tromeo's hand. Oh, that's so gross. Uh, you, you, you know what's funny about this guy is he lost his finger in a weight machine accident, Ooh. which is ironic since in the Toxic Avenger, a weight machine crushes a guy's head there. Right, right. I don't know why that's funny to me, but it is. It's kind of funny. Like I said, there's a lot of irony with this little side character that we don't get i know i'm saying but you kind of said it right i did Ooh. kind of right. i'm improving <laughs> getting better every day <laughs> so tromeo's a little bummed out and murray's like hey we're, we can steal stuff we can steal stuff from the rich people you <laughs> love doing that and so he's like uh, I'll, I'll meet you upstairs um to go steal shit or whatever yeah. and this is where Tromeo sees Juliet from across the room and instantly falls in love. <laughs> well, London comes in and he asks Juliet to dance. And she's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, so Murray's upstairs and he's stealing things, looking through drawers and stuff. And he finds this picture. And this is a picture of Monty Ingrid, which is Cappy's, Juliet's. Yeah. Mom. Juliet's mom, yeah. And this baby boy. Dun, dun, dun. And that'll come into play later. <laughs> Not like how Murray's <laughs> It's a picture of Monty and a baby boy. It's like... <laughs> it's like, what? Oh, he spelled it out for us. <laughs> right. Um, so Julia and London are dancing and Tromeo goes up and he's dressed up like this cow. <laughs> he's got the hat on or the hood or whatever that thing is yeah, yeah. on it because he he's not just like dressed like a cow he's dressed like a mascot he yeah, has like, like a, a mascot cow, cow. mascot <laughs> yeah so to explain that i was yeah. like what so tromeo introduces himself to juliet as she is dancing with london and london <laughs> is pissed but Juliet's like, whatever. And Tromeo's like, you want to dance? She's like, yeah. <laughs> Just leaves London. Uh, and she says that she wants to see his face. So he takes his cow head off. And they start talking in iambic pentameter to each other. The background all fades away and turns into stars. And they're dancing and talking and they're in love. 
it's cheaply beautiful. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. uh, the fact that Shakespeare and trauma mixes so well together was surprising when I first saw this. Uh, a lot of people didn't care for the genuine Shakespeare texts they recite. Uh, we were supposed to have a lot more, like I said, but you know, test audience didn't go for it very well. Uh, but I feel like when they include it in these key scenes, it's fantastic. And you're somewhat moved. Like, right. Uh, right. Which is surprising again for a trauma flick. <laughs> this movie has some genuinely moving moments. <laughs> um, now at this party, you can see Kabuki Man and <laughs> Toxie there as well. Uh, we were also supposed to have them as main characters, like I said, but Gunn talked Lloyd out of that. And I think that's kind of for the best. Because <laughs> so. I could only assume what that was going to be like. It was probably going to be like Toxie as the head of one family and Kabuki Man as the head of the other. <laughs> It may have been hilarious, but I don't. <laughs> Can we talk about how Toxie's at this uh, costume party? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. He just is there. It's kind of funny. Yeah, because it's actually Toxie. He's like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, Romeo. Fuck. So, Tromeo and Juliet kiss. And Tyrone, which is Juliet's cousin, sees this. And he is pissed because he knows that Tromeo is a Q. Yes. And he's going to kick Tromeo's ass. So Tromeo and Murray run away before this happens. And Juliet is now freaked. Juliet is now freaked out that this is a Q. Yeah. Uh, this kiss scene, uh, like I said, is very romantic. <laughs> and I love how, okay, I got, ex I, I love how it goes from the party <laughs> to this starlit sky where no one else is in the room except for each other. So mm -hmm. like, that's all they, it's, it's very, like I said, it's genuinely kind of moving for a trauma movie. Right. Um, they pulled this off with a dark material known as duvetine. Now that's, it. it's a very dark cloth. Like it absorbs like a shit ton of light more than a normal black cloth usually does. So that's how you get that really dark oh, yeah. background that they have. Now, obviously, the stars were just Christmas lights set on flicker behind this, uh, but um, you can see the cloth moving. Now, the idea was to have – they were thinking if we moved it, it makes it look like it's shimmering, mm -hmm. but that's not how it kind of came out on camera. It just looks like – the cloth is moving, but, but it, no, it, it's, it's a very genuinely moving scene. I like it a lot. And <laughs> when they're spinning, that was just them on a lazy Susan. <laughs> nice. <laughs> they don't stand there and they were just, spinning. <laughs> the, they're like dizzy as shit. You gotta, I, I believe there's a making of documentary about this movie too. Troma does a lot of behind the scene documentaries on uh watch Troma or uh, on Troma now, uh, watch.troma.com go there. And they have a bunch of videos like that. Oh. Um, so, yeah, so you get to see the behind the scenes on some of this stuff. And it's the making of these movies is even more interesting than the movies themselves. It's <laughs> it's wild. Oh, I bet. And that kind of leads us into, uh, I think, the movie we're going to do for next Troma Month, uh, Terror Firmer. Um, that is one of the one of the best. But moving on. Sorry. <laughs> Act three. Act three. <laughs> Let me. <laughs> So Murray and Tromeo are talking and Murray thinks that Tromeo was just faking out Juliet like to get to her or something like that. Yeah, like yeah. play a prank on her or whatever. Then he's pissed when he finds out that it was all real. <laughs> <laughs> then Ness is in Juliet's room trying to get with her. And Juliet's like, oh, hell no. <laughs> nah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to have sex with the Tromeo. Yeah. I'm now, saying, more but... more yin yangs though, if you notice. There's one on the hat where uh, Murray and Tromeo are talking. There's one on the hat behind them. There's a yin yang there. Oh, okay. Uh, earlier, you saw one at Meat World. The entire Meat World sign is a yin yang made out of meat, <laughs> if you, if you look, pay attention. Oh, nice. But just more of those. It, it's fun to kind of watch this movie and pick out the yin yangs because they're everywhere in this film. <laughs> I think we've said this on each trauma episode so far, but it goes, I mean, we need to repeat it here. There's so many little gags and stuff that we do not cover. Oh, you yeah. need to watch these movies because oh, yeah, there's and a lot. repeat viewings, <laughs> like repeat viewings really help. It's, it, it's crazy how much they fit into these. Fit. Into <laughs> I was these. just thinking of a hot dog. <laughs> fitting in somewhere oh good lord i don't know why that made me just 
<laughs> get this picture of a hot dog, not even a wiener, just a hot dog. <laughs> it makes me think of a hot dog going in and out of a donut. Ew. Anyway, we'll talk about that when we hit uh, Jason Goes to Hell. But <laughs> Anyway. So, Tromeo sneaks into Juliet's room and just starts sucking her toes. Okay, so I'm sure if you have been listening to these episodes with us, you've probably caught on that I have a foot thing. <laughs> and I've always tried to figure out where that came from, right? Where it started with. Mm -hmm. And with trauma being such an influence on me, maybe it has started from here. I don't <laughs> Maybe because he doesn't even say hi, fuck your mother, nothing like that. He just goes in and starts sucking her fucking toes. Like, that's all right. No, I mean, you don't know where own. those toes have been. She looks showered. Oh, you like freeze frame those toes in you. I'm not commenting. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> so they start saying poems to each other again. Mm -hmm. And. <laughs> <laughs> Juliet's stomach just <laughs> gets big and pregnant and Tromeo just splits it up the middle and Deep. starts eating popcorn out of it like he sticks his head inside <laughs> her stomach to eat popcorn out of it mm. <laughs> and then the popcorn's gone and these rats start to come out of her stomach which again more good at Will Keenan <laughs> So good in this. But um, this is more great acting for him because that part where he's like, mm. <laughs> oh, rah, rah. <laughs> Just, anyway, um, now if y'all have watched uh, Class of Newcomb High and listened to our last episode, you'll know this isn't the first weird pregnancy that happens in one of these movies. <laughs> now, Jane Jensen goes through hell here. Uh, she is coated with makeup multiple times throughout this uh, with this pregnancy belly and later on where she's a cow. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, she had maggots and rats in this uh, preg Ugh. pregnancy belly. Uh, rats. Uh, now, um, okay. Now the maggots were actually mealworms, kind of like what we feed our lizard, those big mealworms. Mm -hmm. um, now Jane did not want these mealworms, but Lloyd and the crew talked her into it. Uh, a problem was no one knew how much fear she really had of these maggots. I'm oh. quoting, but, uh, so when these were dumped on her, she started freaking out and screaming. Oh no. Now, everyone thought it was part of the act and they catch it on camera here. Some of the fear that you see is real, oh, <laughs> but, dang. um, it's, she was freaking out and stuff and they were like, wow, this is fantastic. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is some good acting until she put a pillow over her face and then Lloyd realized something was really wrong. Oh. So Lloyd called cut and got her out of there and they started tearing this stuff off her as quick as possible. Uh, mealworms flying everywhere and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, and then James Gunn literally had to hug her and hold her to comfort her. Oh. <laughs> like to calm her down. Uh, she had a phobia of these things that she, she didn't want to ruin the, the shooting. So she didn't really let on how much fear she literally had. Oh. Uh, Lloyd was so worried that he broke her mentally. Uh, but a half hour later, she came back and finished uh, a oh. little shaken, but you know, she was otherwise okay. But Lloyd said he had trouble sleeping that night because <laughs> he felt so bad about oh. it. Uh, that's a thing with Lloyd. Uh, you'll notice like on the stories and stuff you hear about behind the scenes and stuff, he's a traditionally like just really nice guy right <laughs> he really does right. care about the people he's working <laughs> with um lloyd said the bad part was you you can barely see these worms in the shot <laughs> right so it was kind of all for not anyway <laughs> but but yeah the fear you see on jane's face for a split second there is genuine so juliet wakes up from this dream because this was all a dream thank god <laughs> and her dad is like it right next to her in bed and oh god he's drinking and he pulls her out of bed by her hair and drags her to this room um with this clear box um that he calls her timeout box yeah he's pissed he's like you woke me up one too many times screaming <laughs> he's like he, he was talking, I don't know if it was this scene or, or the last one, but 
He talks about her orgasm screams. Yeah, he has a weird fascination with her. Yeah, it's really weird. It well, I think it plays <laughs> on that theme about youth versus old age and stuff. Like, uh, he's suppressing her sexuality. Right. You know, and I, I feel like that's maybe what that's meaning because he's like really down on these like, and if you notice throughout the movie, he's like. He like calls something of hers, which isn't a butt plug, but he calls it a butt plug. And then earlier he's talking about a curling iron, like a sex toy. And it's really weird. Oh, yeah. He called her. Um, It was like a curler for her hair. Yeah. Like yeah. her butt plug or whatever. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. But um, uh, this scene where it, it, this is. Remember when I mentioned the glass box metaphor and stuff? Oh, he, he chains like, her. Yeah, he chains, he her, chains her, her in this glass keeps, box. Yeah. Keeps yeah. her feelings in this glass box. Yeah. Uh, but. Because I believe he mentions there's a line where he's like, all dreams lead to here. <laughs> like, it's yeah. really creepy. Yeah. This scene is pretty disturbing, actually, and it gets a legitimate scare out of me. <laughs> yeah. And now the timeout room was James Gunn's idea. But uh, Lloyd was fearful that the box wouldn't be built on time and that it might be dangerous up high like this. Uh, mm -hmm. But it all came together nicely and safely. He's actually, you know, he's like, I, I can't believe they pulled it off so well. Uh, the worst part was that the warehouse that they had to use as a sound stage here because they had a little warehouse that they quartered off a part of the room for a sound stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it reached very high temperatures. Oh no. Yeah. And they tried to crank in some portable AC and stuff, but it, the, the noise was so loud they couldn't use it. And so the actors were like, well, fuck it. Let's just do this. And I'm like, we'll, we'll go ahead and get it done. Uh, the credit to the makeup staff who worked overtime trying to ha hide the sweat in the love scene coming up. Oh, I bet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they had to get super creative with this box as well so you didn't see the camera. Right. Uh, Lloyd has said like, any movement would have, it was caught in this box. Mm -hmm. Like you could see everything. But if you watch the movie, you don't see shit. So they, they really pulled it off. It really looks nice. I would say so, yeah. yeah. I didn't think about you could see the reflection of the camera yeah. and stuff. It's so crazy because, like I said, you know, trauma, lack of budget, <laughs> barely any budget. But yet that forces them to be more creative than some of the other things because fucking a, another low budget from a big studio, you might have seen the camera. So Tromeo goes and breaks into the Capulet's house and Cappy, before he like shuts the door of this timeout room, <laughs> he's saying that. The women and children should behave themselves. He says that all dreams will lead to the box if she keeps screaming in her sleep. And he is super drunk. He shuts the door and stumbles down the hallway and just passes out on the floor. <laughs> yeah. And this song you hear during these like really uh, ominous parts of the movie mm -hmm. that I will gather at the river <laughs> yes we'll gather at the you know that's it um that's a homage to john ford who used to use uh that song in some of his films mostly at funeral scenes oh okay <laughs> more useless information that nobody asked for <laughs> right so tromeo was walking through the house and he stumbles across ness and she tells him that she loves juliet like he does but she, but Juliet does not love her. She loves Tromeo. Yeah. So she tells him how to get where Juliet is. So he goes up these stairs, steps over Cappy, which is very brave. <laughs> Passed out drunk. Right? Yeah. But I guess Tromeo is probably used to that because of his dad. Yeah, maybe. Being a drunk. Yeah. I didn't even think about that oh, until just now. Point. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so he finds Juliet and they start reciting the classic Romeo and Juliet lines of wherefore art thou? Yeah, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Look blah. how she lays her hand upon her cheek. <laughs> and it's her ass cheek. <laughs> and it's her ass cheek. <laughs> and they start, they start talking about how their lives are fucked, basically. But they don't know any difference, so it's hard to get out of. So they have... They st mm, words. I was so <laughs> Yeah. So they start to have sex. <laughs> like hardcore sex. For like six minutes straight. <laughs> uh, so we're watching a trauma movie with a side of porn. Not a, a heaping side of porn. <laughs> and at one point, Ness, Ness walks in and she's just watching them. Then 
they fall asleep and they wake up to music. Yeah. Uh, so Lloyd has uh, said that <laughs> he kind of agrees with you. Uh, the scene may have gone on a little longer than it should have in retrospect. Uh, he also said that if it was more graphic, maybe it'd feel a little less lengthy. <laughs> No, that's, no. That's Lloyd for you. <laughs> but but I feel it's a really good scene uh, for obvious reasons. I don't know. Boobs? It's nice. Porn? You don't get to see this in the Romeo and Juliet movie. The whole time you're watching that, you're like, are these two going to fuck? <laughs> no, but They're sitting no, here talking pretty language to each other. Oh, oh, they <laughs> fucked back then. I meant in place. They fucked. They had bathhouses where they would go fuck. <laughs> like People were fucking in the open. <laughs> I, that's another thing people dismiss at Elizabethan times. I think is so like highbrow, like reserved. It was not. It was probably a lot more dirty than what we got going on now. <laughs> well, now we're willing to talk about it. Right, right. Uh, uh, Will Keenan. You know, I've been preaching about Will Keenan in this movie. Jane Jensen does a great job too. But uh, Will Keenan was one of the first digital stars in a fully digital feature. Uh, digital film, that is. Um, oh. I love God back in 1998. Now, Will would play a completely different character in Kaufman's Terror Firmer, like we talked about. <laughs> and and I'm going to save that as a surprise for when you actually watch that movie. <laughs> oh, you're not going to tell me the whole plays. movie? No, no, no. Just half of it? Just half of it. <laughs> but some listeners might recognize him from Law & Order SVU where he played a toy mogul who was accused of molestation. Uh, his character in that show is kind of like a Michael Jackson type okay. person where he's like immature and acts like a child. He's legitimately creepy in that show. And at the end of the episode, they kind of leave it ambiguous of whether he did it or not. It's, it's fucking scary Ooh. because they find out like, this is not an SVU podcast, but <laughs> they find out like, uh, the lady who's accusing him is a con artist, but he has all these other accusations and stuff. So it's kind of left up in the air whether, you know, this person he didn't molest, but did he do the, other? you know, it's left that way. <laughs> okay. SVU. This is a good show. <laughs> okay. Why don't you ever let me watch it? Uh, you Only watch the Maloney years. Don't, don't bother with any of the others. Oh, okay. Actually, I think that was, I think that episode was when Jeff Goldblum was on the show and that was a good one. That was good, some good episodes. Oh, my God. Sorry, everybody. Is this an SVU podcast? People have learned two things about me today. I love Shakespeare and SVU. Anyway. <laughs> oh, shit. So since the music comes on, because Juliet had said earlier something about when whatever show comes on, um, my dad lets me out of the box, and they hear the music from that show. So... Tromeo has to leave. Yeah, yeah, he's got to get out. And it, he wants her to run away with him. Did you ever? Oh, I'm sorry. For some reason, this scene reminds me of like, did you ever have to sneak out before the parents woke up? Was that ever your thing? Uh, no, but I did have people sneak out. Oh, of your house. Yes. Same, same my thing. Parents got same home. thing. Yeah, same thing. Yes. But uh, didn't it give you those feelings? <laughs> oh, get out before the dad catches yeah. you. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. So, Tromeo wants her to run away with him, but she says she can't because she's supposed to get married. And he says, well, you can't uh, marry him if you marry me instead. And she, she agrees. And he sneaks out. Mm -hmm. A little bit later. I don't know the time frame. <laughs> but... <laughs> London brings Juliet some flowers and he surprises her with honeymoon tickets to see the world's largest cattle herd. <laughs> what? She's like, uh, uh, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I don't want to see that. Yeah. Um, so J Juliet takes this opportunity to tell him that she can't marry him and that there is someone else. So, he decides he's going to start punching himself in the face and just beating himself up right there in the foyer. Fun time. Uh, <laughs> no, Arbuckle has actually gotten tickets to Swansea, uh, <laughs> Swansea, which is an industrial section in England. <laughs> there are no cows. <laughs> Oh God! This uh, this always got a big laugh out of the crowds from London because if you know about London and stuff, you know Swansea is just an industrial park, basically. 
<laughs> That's what we would call it here in the States. Uh, Monty Python has had a lot of influence on Lloyd and Michael, and you can kind of tell in the in this movie, if you're familiar with the Monty Python movies. No. Um, I know. I haven't know. seen anything. But hopefully our listeners are. Well, I would think so, because I think I'm the only person in the world that hasn't seen that. That's sad. We gotta we gotta force you to watch those sometime. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> You're lucky it's just a horror movie podcast <laughs> would be <laughs> Oh my god. So Tromeo goes to see his priest and he tells him that he wants to marry Juliet tonight. Yes. And his priest is like, Hail to the year. <laughs> so Juliet's waiting for Tromeo to call and because he says he will. <laughs> While she's waiting, she finds this magazine, which has a phone sex line in it. And the picture on this magazine looks kind of like Tromeo. A little. Oh, barely. (laughs) Barely. It's just like a hunk. (laughs) Right. So she calls this phone sex line and she's masturbating. And the guy on the other line is this huge fat dude. He's just like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, doing it for you, uh, honey. Uh, mm-hmm. We are having some major sex. <laughs> so this is your first introduction to Joe Flyshaker, uh, a trauma legend. Uh, <laughs> he'll pop up often in these uh, as he was in every Kaufman directed trauma movie between 1989 and 2006. Uh, he was a fantastic character actor uh, with the ability to give you the giggles just by appearing on screen like here, you know? <laughs> He barely has to do anything and he's making you laugh your ass off. <laughs> right. So Michael Hurst doesn't like being in the public eye. I, I believe I've said that on another episode. Uh, that's why you don't see him very often. You yeah. see Lloyd all the time. Uh, so when they would shoot little joke shorts and videos where uh, Michael Hurst is supposed to be there, they would have Joe Flyshaker do that. <laughs> <laughs> he would play Michael Hurst. He did nice. that so much that people began to think he was actually Michael Hurst. Oh, wow. Which is hilarious because Michael Hurst is a fit guy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's a very healthy guy. Um, But the ad she finds in this magazine, if you look at the face, that's James Gunn. (laughs) That's James Gunn's face pasted over this model. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. So Tromeo's trying to call in, but he can't get through because apparently the Capulets uh, don't have call waiting. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) That was a good one. <laughs> but I uh, heard Joe Flushick after she's done masturbating. You done? <laughs> <laughs> you done? He says something. He's like, "Oh yeah, I'm Tromeo." <laughs> yeah, like I'm like Tromeo. <laughs> yeah, I'm Tromeo. Yeah. So he's like sitting there eating a fucking scene. <laughs> I fucking love Joe Flushick. Him, honestly, him and uh, Pat Ryan <laughs> are fucking great. So she gets done masturbating <laughs> and Tromeo finally gets through to her and he is naked on the toilet. Yes, he is. Yeah, I'm going to skip over that part. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Because it's one of the best jokes. So they're talking <laughs> and he's shitting and there's just like this diarrhea noise and she's like what's that noise what's that no- <laughs> it like came after a really sweet sentimental part <laughs> but- and then it cuts to uh, <laughs> i love this movie it cuts to them getting married by the priest in the church uh-huh and this was at the same church in jersey city that sergeant kabuki man is filmed at the uh, parts of that movie were filmed here okay so they get married and they decide that they're gonna fuck all over town like they're outside fucking they're inside fucking everywhere fucking i love this little montage because they they go to a porn theater they go all over the place they go and get the uh, each other's names tattooed on them which is a great little gag where she's sitting there laughing as she's (laughs) and he's crying Crying. (laughs) um and then Tromeo goes and drops Juliet off at her house so she can tell her parents what's up that she got married. Uh, now this scene uh, with her fucking in front of the New York Public Library <laughs> that was stolen because obviously they wouldn't give Lloyd a permit to film this. Oh, you can't have a permit yeah. to fuck but, in front of the library. But more, uh, more, uh, more testament to Will Keenan and uh, 
Jane Jensen's performance here that they were willing to bear ass right in the middle of fucking right. public traffic was going on it. And if you've ever been to New York, which I haven't, but you know, I've have friends up there, but it's busy. <laughs> well, not now, sadly, but it's very busy during this time. So you just imagine driving by and seeing this shit going on. <laughs> right. And now I've always felt like the tattoos that they get are more symbols of that emotions and stuff like feeling like they're outsiders in the world and stuff like that. You know, it's more of that theme of youth. Yes. V- youth. 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 Those damn youths. <laughs> Act four. <laughs> Lemmy. <laughs> I fucking miss Lemmy. I wish he didn't die. <laughs> Even though for a rocker, he lived a long life. <laughs> really? Lemmy lived a long life for all the stuff he did. There, there's stories where Lemmy was a fucking real life pirate. Like, there's stories of, like, how he was just tossing back drinks like they were water. Just fucking chucking. Like, like it was nothing. And he lived that long. That's okay. That's okay. So, London's at Meat World, and he's crying, beating his head on a pig, like, <laughs> so hard his head is bleeding. Shoves his head in the pig at one point. That's a real pig, by the way. That's disgusting. <laughs> and... Um, Tyrone and his friends come in and he tells Tyrone that Julia loves somebody else and then stabs himself with a meat hook. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Meat World really was filmed at a pork plant. That's why, you know, the real pig there. Um, if you notice Tyrone and this, we haven't really touched on this, but Tyrone is carrying a Hitler club (laughs) with a big, huge spike on the end. And through most of Troma's films, you've probably seen this already. And I I think I've mentioned it, but Hitler and the use of Nazi Nazi imagery is used to convey evil. Uh, Lloyd said it kind of stuck with him being born like not too long after the war. Mm-hmm. You know, because people were still it was still fresh on their mind for a long time, uh, Hitler and stuff. So it just always kind of stuck with him that that's a good representation of evil. I would agree. What you notice in all these movies, anytime the Nazi symbols or anything <laughs> are used, it's always evil. But that's how, I mean, that's how I live a lot in my life is I see those things as evil. Yeah, see? So, you know. Right. That's what I said. A lot of the stuff you see in a trauma movie, it just does not come from a mean place. Right. All of this right. stuff does not come. I think that's why, like I said, you can see a kid's head getting crushed and a fetus <laughs> getting ripped out and you're having a good time. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Tyrone and his crew go to the tattoo shop because they want to find Tromeo and they want to talk to Murray. And Murray keeps calling Tyrone all kinds of names. Tyrone's going to beat up Murray and then Tromeo, Tromeo shows up. <laughs> why did I say it like that? <laughs> Tromeo. Tromeo. And as they're, as Tyrone is talking to Tromeo, I don't know why this is tripping me up with all the teas. <laughs> there is a lot of teas here. <laughs> uh, Murray pees on Tyrone. So they all start to fight and Murray stabs a guy in the eye with a tattoo gun. <laughs> I love which, that part. Ouch. Yeah. Tyrone goes to hit Tromeo with this Nazi club thing right. and hits Murray in the head with it instead and it's sticking out of the side of his head and the Capulet crew run off. Murray is like dying <laughs> and he says his last dying wish is to kiss Tromeo and Tromeo is like, huh? And he's just like, it's my last dying wish. <laughs> so Tromeo kisses him. Now Val, um, the actor who plays a uh, Murray, he was actually, uh, coming out of the closet around this time. Oh, nice. Yeah. So he was actually gay in real life, but, um, in fact, Sean Gunn told this story. I Now, this is from Sean Gunn in a commentary at one point where he tells the story how Murray was telling him about this fantasy he had of a big black football player pickling him up and cradling him. Aww. <laughs> it's weird. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Val's acting here in this scene is really, really good. It is really good. <laughs> it's legitimately yeah. good. He was really crying here Aww. like and stuff. And so the crew – was even crying with it. Like the cast members were kind of teary eyed. And even James Gunn was kind of had a little tears in his eyes uh, because his acting was just so good. And Lloyd has said, you know, when they built the club that sticks out of his head, you know, it's separate from the pl- prop that Tyrone carries. Mm-hmm. Um, when they built that club, 
it came out a lot cheaper than they wanted it to. Like you can see every time he moves, it's flopping. Yeah, you can see it moving. Yeah, yeah. it's made of rubber and it's like too short, <laughs> like oh, from what yeah. the other club was. But um, Lloyd's like nobody ever complains about this because of how good his acting is in the scene, and it's like a testament to how an actor can really like <laughs> fix anything in a scene. I think that's what. Oh yeah. Even though I said you know there's overacting and then over overacting in a trauma flick. It's still good acting. <laughs> right. Again, right. Like, trauma is trauma. You, know? <laughs> you always ask me when I get done watching one of these movies what I think. And I never go into detail except for it's a trauma movie. Yeah. See, that's all you have. So Tromeo is pissed. His best friend is dead <laughs> by a Capulet. And, you know, we, we just can't have that. Right. So he runs out and starts to fight with Tyrone. And I liked this little part because he pushes Tyrone into this ladder and his arm rips off. I liked this little (laughs) gag of that. Yeah, that was good. Um, This fight scene, again, is surprisingly good. (laughs) Like a lot of fight scenes in trauma are. There are those fight scenes that you're like, wow, this is pretty good. (laughs) Yeah. This is good choreography. Um, They shot this scene with three cameras. Uh, Benny is in the background here fighting with Caplet crew. Now, Tiffany Shepis, who's a great actress and trained in jujitsu, she accidentally kicked Steve Blackheart in the face. Uh, Steve Blackheart playing Benny. Oh, no. It was hard enough for him to have to go to the hospital to get stitches. Uh, The problem was that during rehearsal, she did this stunt barefoot. And then when she was on camera, she did it with those high heels. Oh. So the extra little bit of length caused a misjudgment and distance, you know. Um, so really, like, just a little, it's an accident. But but so so if you notice, there's a split scene and stuff, and they try not to get it on camera too much, but they had to have a stand-in for uh, Steve Blackheart while he was at the hospital. Oh, get wow. Get stitched up. And the stand-in is like a bearded fat guy. <laughs> it's like doesn't look like anything like him at all. So it's like, and it's just it, it was basically just a crew member that was wearing an orange shirt. Oh yeah, because <laughs> they're Benny, like you. You're wearing an orange shirt. Yeah. Come here. <laughs> yeah. So they had to split second have somebody stand in for a minute. That's funny. <laughs> it's just so funny. So this ladder that's sticking out of this car that rips his arm off, it it throws him into the car. Yeah, or whatever. Tromeo, like, the, uh, he's holding Tromeo up against this light post. And Tromeo, <laughs> Tromeo <laughs> tosses him into this car because he sees the ladder sticking out. And that's what rips, because Tromeo still has <laughs> oh, Tyrone's that's right. arm. Yes, her, Tromeo still has Tyrone's arm, but D- Tyrone is attached to this ladder yeah, on this yeah. car that's still moving. And then finally, the car um, slams on its brakes and Tyrone's head gets cut off by a tow truck bed. They're like lifting this car onto this tow truck and slices it clean off. And the guy who's working the tow truck talking to the other guy is like, yeah, you got to work hard to get ahead in line. <laughs> and I'm a sucker for those kind of. <laughs> and Tyrone's head lands on this car with a family in it. It's a mom, a dad, and two kids. And they're driving and they're singing along. La, la, la. <laughs> And this head lands on their car. And the the kids are laughing. They think it's the best thing er- ever. And the parents are freaking out. And the dad accidentally drives into another car and flips their car. And they get out. And, uh, of course, the parents are freaking out. And the kids are playing <laughs> with this head. Again, it's just some trauma over the top. And then the car blows up. <laughs> now, this car flip here was originally filmed in Sergeant Kabuki Man, but it was such it was such a good shot that they would use the scene of the flip over and over again for more films because it was just such a great stunt. And you can't <laughs> get that again right. because of their lack of budget. <laughs> so they just use that, and and they work in uh, new scenes. Around the flip, so it looks like it's a brand new scene. Right. But um, that's James Gunn in the front seat of the car playing the dad oh, okay. of the family that's singing, I found a peanut. <laughs> it, it's, it sounds like we're just giggling to nothing here, I'm sure, to our <laughs> listeners. But you got to watch this movie because this scene hilarious. is hilarious. And the kids love it. <laughs> 
So the police show up and they arrest two of the Capulet people. And the detective makes this girl tell him who did this and she rats out Tromeo. I want to say this girl was maybe Georgie. Uh, yeah, I believe it was Georgie. Because you only see her for a second, so it's yeah. kind of hard to tell. But I think it's Georgie. Well, a little bit later, Georgie and Ness tell Cappy about Juliet and Tromeo fucking. Mm-hmm. Like, they kind of say it like that. Yeah, yeah. Cappy goes to beat the crap out of Juliet because he is pissed. You cannot get with a Q. Yeah. And you're supposed to be wearing Arbuckle. Because he's trying to join film and meat into a multi-billion dollar industry. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but okay. <laughs> Eating hot dogs at the movie theater? I guess. I don't know. Oh, don't eat those hot dogs, by the way. I know. I used to work at the theater. Don't eat those movie theater hot dogs. I know. I used to work at the Ugh. theater. And he commands her that she is going to marry London. Oh, yeah. So then it cuts to the scene of detectives breaking into Monty's house looking for Tromeo and again he's drunk and just farting (laughs) it's hilarious oh my god and then we get this quick cut and I didn't like this because it didn't make sense to me but Julia and London are having dinner together and she says that she wants to get back together well you know only because her father makes her but it's to it's just like an establishing thing it's like um well, not an establishing shot. It's just to show how under control she is from Cappy, you know, because the the scene they're eating meat. Oh, they're like yeah. making her eat meat even though she's a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's more torture for Jane Jensen because in real life she was a vegetarian. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. This poor girl had to go I through know. everything. That's what Lloyd says. He's like, man, <laughs> <laughs> she had to eat this disgusting meat. <laughs> We've all been there, honey. (laughs) (laughs) So the detectives are still looking for Tromeo and they go to Benny's house or their Tromeo's apartment or whatever it is. And Benny is fucking some girl and he says, eat me. (laughs) And the cop just like (laughs) knocks him out. Eat me, Beretta. (laughs) If you don't know who Beretta is, don't worry about it. It's just a funny joke. (laughs) So everybody is looking for Tromeo. Mm -hmm. Everybody. And Juliet goes to the priest and she's crying because she doesn't know where Tromeo is. And the priest actually has him there. And they're so happy to see each other. Tromeo says that he needs to run away because everyone is after him. And Juliet says that she'll run away, but she needs to make things right with London first. And it makes them want to fuck. I don't know. (laughs) Ah, they just want to fuck the fuck. <laughs> so then Juliet goes to talk to the priest about getting rid of London because he said he might know a way. Yeah. He may know somebody that will help him. So it, he gives her the name. Sorry. I'm just laughing. This scene. Um, oh, it, I totally yeah, did not even touch yeah. on this. Oh, this scene also makes a this. little ew, uh, makes a comment on religion with the priest being kind of shady with kids because he's thinking. Yeah. Back, Have you ever loved some? <laughs> Thinks about him frolicking with a little boy. Uh, Lloyd was a little hesitant to include this, um, mostly because remember this is the '90s. You, at that point in American culture, you didn't really—I don't know—you didn't really openly make fun of religion or priests touching little boys. Yeah, or you'd quite literally get crucified. At the time, <laughs> you know, pun intended. But like back then, you'd really—I don't fuck. I don't think we openly started making fun of religion until the 2000s. But. Um, but yeah, James Gunn luckily talked him into this little scene because I think it's hilarious. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because like Lloyd says, you know, it shows, you know, no one's above approach here. You know, <laughs> no one's right. clean. Right. Because uh, we know. We know. And we knew back then. And that fucked up. We all knew back then. And it took how long to start? You know what? What's fucked up is they dismissed that one dude in Australia. I have no clue what you're talking about. Never so. mind. Never mind. Moving on. <laughs> So this is a weekend update. We don't need- <laughs> So Juliet goes to Chinatown to see this guy. What's his name? I forget off the top of I my head. I forget too. But he he sounds he has a, a Chinese sounding name. But, right. But I think I mentioned to you, I was like, you do know Chinatown's in New York, right? Because <laughs> I've had yes. several people 
I'd been watching a movie with and they've been like, wait, how'd they get to China? I'm like, dude, they're in New York, Chinatown. Right. Yeah, but that's China. Chinatown. China, Chinatown. China, it's a place. Do you not watch movies? Do you not like look at things <laughs> or read about things? Like, do you not do the things? Oh, my God. How is Americans so dumb about their own country? <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so she goes into this place that's like a drug house because there's people like shooting up heroin and shit. <laughs> and she goes back and <laughs> the guy that she needs to see is this Rastafarian guy. <laughs> it's completely not and what you she's were expecting. Like, she's like, what? Because she wasn't expecting it either. And Julia tells him her like whole life story. He gives her this herb drink to get rid of anyone that loves her for only her beauty. Right, right. <laughs> Fu Chang. Oh, Fu, Chang. Fu Chang was the guy's name. Um, but uh, the guy who plays Fu Chang was a last minute replacement because the original actor actually suffered a heart attack. Oh, no. Uh, before they got the role. And now the original actor can actually be seen earlier in the film. Uh, the guy holding the giant worm. That's who was supposed to play Fu Chang. So they gave him a little role, you know. To, oh, but, nice. <laughs> but, but yeah, Fu Chang is not what you would think. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, just some Rastafarian yeah, guy yeah. smoking some weed. <laughs> Act five, Lemmy. <laughs> Why do you keep saying Lemmy after Because uh, nobody knows it's Lemmy. I'm doing it first. I think we know now. I have to label it. <laughs> Does it make you feel better about yourself? Yes. Okay. I feel like it's kind of making me into an old man telling a joke. Oh. Yeah, see what the voice I was doing there was. Uh, oh, my God. That was, uh, that, was that guy, yeah. Sounded like him, huh? Okay. Yeah? Did it sound like him? <laughs> no. Oh, pretty cool, huh? No. Didn't sound like me. No. All right. <laughs> so Juliet calls the priest, and she tells him that London's coming over at noon or whatever time. And he says he will be there to pick her up. He, She just has to do what she has to do. Yeah, yeah. So she drinks the stuff that the guy gave her. And it makes her sick, and her skin starts to boil or whatever, and she thinks she's going to die, which I probably would, too, think that I was going to die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she starts hallucinating, and she sees Sammy, Murray, and Tyrone. So this was weird to me, because they never explained that Sammy died. Uh-huh. Until this scene. Well, yeah, you can tell he dies on the ground, but then nobody talks about him, <laughs> if you're right. I don't but- think... I I don't remember him dying on the ground. Yeah, yeah, he falls over and he's like, <clears throat> "Oh, yeah, yeah." Oh, okay, a, well, I guess I missed where that. the dude walking by with the lizards looking. Did you notice oh, I that guess in the I background? Did not That's catch another that. thing. Like I said, there's all these little. Things. Yeah, I guess I did not catch that. So she sees Sammy Murray and Tyrone, and they're telling her that she's going to die, and they start singing that "Gathering at the River" yep. song that you were talking How about. We gather. Yeah. So she finally comes to. Oh, sorry, think about sex there. <laughs> Is it working for her? No. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. And the poison starts poison or potion or whatever. The potion starts making her ugly, and she starts changing all crazy like, and then she turns into a cow. <laughs> of all things, a cow. Yeah. London shows up to talk to her, and he tells her that he knows that she doesn't love him. And she turns around <laughs> and it scares the fuck out of him. He like jumps off the bed and everything. And then he's like, um, I'm going to have to think about marrying you. It's just acne. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. And she gets him real good and makes him leave by showing him her cow dick. <laughs> this big old gross cow dick hanging down. She lifts up her dress and oh, there's it's just so a big funny. old dick. <laughs> it's great obviously her changing into a cow is they had more commentary on meat and stuff mm-hmm. right i don't have to spell that out really and tromeo is a cow on meat. yeah anyway yeah. there's a lot of little subtle hints so he he starts to puke after seeing <laughs> the cow dick and this makes him jump out of the window jump out of this fucking window. every single one of these movies somebody has jumped out oh of the yeah window. you gotta do that <laughs> I That's guess. a fun sequence. It's fun. So her dad comes in and he sees her like that and he is pissed. Oh, yeah. 
Now, Arbuckle jumping out the window was played by a stuntman. Um, he was supposed to jump through this candy glass and land on some boxes at the bottom. Now, the other stunt guys and stuff requested this quarter-inch candy glass, which the crew thought it would be better go with a thinner glass. Oh. Uh, but the stuntmen wanted uh, it to look more realistic, so they had they went with the thicker stuff. They did this because they wanted to get some publicity shots. For future projects so they could show – it's like a sizzle reel. They could show oh, to yeah. future clients and stuff. Uh, but now, Arthur Jolly, the stuntman, <laughs> went to jump through this stuff and the glass didn't break. So mm. he just cracked his head on this and <laughs> so hard that the window frame gave and the whole window falls out. Oh, no. Now, uh, they did reset this and Arthur went out the right way. You just threw an empty window. And uh, – <laughs> But with way too much force because he he misjudged and was thinking glass was still there, so oh, he goes out no. this. Now the way they were, Arbuckle's supposed to land on the ground and stuff. Well, that was on a a balcony, mm-hmm. so he's jumping from a, a a a window onto a balcony below. Shit, I hit my mic onto a balcony below. Mm-hmm. And now this was four stories up. Oh shit. So if he <laughs> luckily there was a the still photographer's face was there to catch him. Oh fuck. <laughs> because if he wouldn't have, he would have went over the railing of this balcony and dropped onto the cement about four stories down. <laughs> so uh, kind of scary. <laughs> so Tromeo and the priest pull up and run inside. And some of the capulets are there, I think uh Ness and um Georgie. Yeah. And some guy, some guy. Oh, uh, that's a, her oboe instructor. Remember we were Oh, that's right. <laughs> Juliet's oboe instructor. <laughs> Which, Wait, what? <laughs> and she never plays the oboe yeah, in yeah. this, so it was a little confusing. <laughs> so they're trying to stop them, but the priest says that he can handle it, and Tromeo runs upstairs. <laughs> this is where the priest starts kung fu fighting everybody. <laughs> And he kills the guy by stomping on his head. <laughs> and this is the worst. <laughs> like, it's not a good effect. It's funny, though. It is funny. It's played for laughs. Oh, it's but, definitely funny. <laughs> but, man, that's one thing you'll never, uh, trauma my, will never fuck you over on is a good head crushing. You'll always get a head crushing in these <laughs> movies. You get your money's worth. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Cappy and Juliet are fighting, and he tells her that he's going to kill her and fuck her at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh, he's such a fucking... Ugh. Ugh. So Tromeo shows up, and him and Cappy start to fight, and it, it, he knocks Cappy out and goes and makes out with Juliet, and she turns back to normal. She's not a cow anymore. I love how the the fantasy star thing superimposed over the transformations and stuff. I, yeah. I love that kind of thing. It's it's cheesy, but it feels it fits really well uh, with the look of this movie because this movie truly is a punk rock take on the story, oh, and it yeah. has so many fantasy elements in it. It's <laughs> it's fun. So I guess as Juliet's like transforming back, um, Cappy comes to it and he goes to get his bow and comes to, back to beat up. Tromeo. Yeah. Juliet burns him with her curling iron and then stabs him in the ear with a bobby pin. Oh, 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 that was rough. Yes. Yes. I could take the burning, but not the bobby uh, And then when he pulls pins. him out and he's got his eardrums on the end of it. <laughs> she then grabs a nail file and starts to stab him in the back with it. And then shoves a hair dryer in his mouth while it's running. That's a, like a brutal way to right? die, man. Shit. And then Tromeo shoves <laughs> tampons up his nose and hits him with a book of Shakespeare. Fitting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cappy's going to shoot Tromeo with a bow, but Juliet takes this, I don't know, is it a computer? Is it a TV? I don't know, but this monitor and shoves it on his head. Yeah. I love how all these things uh, that do Cappy in are, are symbols of youth and sexuality and beauty. Right. It's nice. It, it, like I said, the youth versus old age thing. Uh, really heavily put in front of you here. But uh, plus the book of Shakespeare that gets him good. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that, I'm a sucker for those kind of puns and stuff. Um, 
that's a, that's actually a computer monitor that she cracks over his head. And yes, okay. yes, dear listeners, youngins out there, <laughs> 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 computers were giant box monstrosities at one point. Yes. I remember being so excited about getting, and they were called CRT monitors, these big TV box looking motherfuckers. And I remember I got one of the brand new ones that was painted black. You know, I, and I take that, uh, that computer monitor crashing over his head and there there's like the porn scene earlier and stuff. It, it's a, <laughs> it's a commentary on, uh, on how the internet is the last free highway for the future and the, the young people and stuff against these dinosaurs who control radio and film. Right. You know, you can't have your own radio station no more. Um, you can't get on TV or in the movies barely <laughs> like, <laughs> unless you're super fucking lucky. Hell YouTube is that way. And, with YouTube, we're seeing an encroach on the internet now, and that's kind of sad. So, Tromeo and Juliet run off, and Cappy chases them and corners them in the room with the timeout box. Yeah. <laughs> he has this computer he's, monitor on his yeah, head still. got still. this computer monitor. He punches them both, and they kind of knock out. And he goes into the box to mess with the chains. Right. As she's coming to... She grabs the plug for the monitor and says, she's not daddy's little Crenshaw melon anymore. And she plugs it in and it <laughs> electrocutes him and then blows up his head. Yeah. Cause earlier in it's the film, great. she's like, you're my Crenshaw. <laughs> like, he makes her say that. It's gross. <laughs> He's like, who are you? She's like, daddy's little Crenshaw melon. <laughs> Where have I heard this before? I don't know. I think you've seen this movie at one point. Actually, I don't know what a Crimshaw Millen is. That's funny. Um, now, uh, they shot the scene where Cappy's head explodes. Uh, they filmed the aftermath uh, where he is laying there all gory and stuff. And there's brains on the box and stuff. Uh, they filmed that uh, before the explosion uh, because they were worried because, you know, trauma <laughs> thinks ahead. And they always have a plan B. They figured if the pyrotechnics were to mess up or not work, then they'd have this in scene and you know they could fit some stuff in there together well luckily they did that because the pyrotechnics were too aggressive when they blew up it it destroyed the box it caught the room on fire the cloth and stuff it, it caught the lights on fire and almost bur it, it basically burnt down this oh, warehouse almost um but it would have ruined the shot if they didn't get this aftermath you know i just found something what's that Ever seen a Crenshaw melon cut in half? No. Looks like a vagina. Oh, gross. Now it makes sense. Yeah. Ew. We just discovered a new little thing. And apparently it's a song. And somebody's name on Instagram. <laughs> oh, wow. But yeah, now the Crenshaw melon thing. See, I'm telling you, there's these hidden little things in this movie that are very smart. <laughs> So it's a little bit later and the police come and the, the priest gets them out of these murder charges. Self-defense. Self-defense. <laughs> yep. And the Capulet girls are handcuffed and taking the blame for all this stuff, basically, that can't be claimed as self-defense. Yeah, yeah. The police or the detectives or whatever says that they're free to go. Uh, Tromeo and Juliet, they're going to leave. But Monty... And Ingrid show up, and Monty tells them that when Tromeo was a baby, that Monty traded silky films for Tromeo, even though he wasn't Tromeo's dad. And he's like, I'm black. <laughs> Tromeo's <laughs> like, oh, I wondered about that. <laughs> but that's a sweet little scene. You know, he didn't want to lose his son, even though it wasn't his. Right. Yeah. So uh, Monty had agreed that he would never tell anybody that Tromeo wasn't his and that actually Tromeo is Cappy's son, <laughs> Cappy and Ingrid's son, and that makes Tromeo and Juliet brother and sister. <laughs> and they're like, hmm, hmm. Okay, who who cares? And they just drive well, we've off. Gone this far, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then they drive off together because that's what we do. <laughs> I guess when you're in love, epilogue. <laughs> Lenny, 
Lemmy. Lemmy. That's so funny. I can't do a Lemmy voice. I wish I could. <laughs> Six years later. <laughs> <laughs> they're having this barbecue. It's Tromeo. It's Juliet. It's, uh, I think Ingrid's there. Monty's there. Uh, Benny's there. Everybody's there. That love them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they have... <laughs> Tromeo and Juliet have two little girls, these these beautiful little mutant girls. <laughs> I remember you were like, they couldn't just leave it alone. Huh? They, they just <laughs> couldn't. couldn't. Just they just couldn't. The, the sunset. We no. have to have more. Oh. <laughs> so they have got these little mutant girls. One of them has like an extra face. <laughs> the other one, I don't remember because I was so cringed out by this. And then they also. Incest. <laughs> then they have this little boy. Who's named Murray. And he's a perfect little angel. <laughs> the incest just happened. You were with... bothered by this. Wait. Did Juliet have sex with somebody else? Dun, dun, dun. Anyway. <laughs> so it's, it ends <laughs> there. And we get that nice little ending with uh, Lemmy reciting some more Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> they get... The most terrifying ending ever. Uh, Tromeo and Juliet are middle class suburbanites. Now, I think this is the only ending that deals with incest that I'm okay with. <laughs> Again, it's trauma. <laughs> How are they doing? <laughs> we had a good time here. Uh, what did you think of Tromeo and Juliet? I really liked this one. Yeah? Yes. Out of all the trauma movies, is this your favorite so far? Yes. That's cool. It's one of my... It's one of my top favorite i know it's hard to pick for me but it's one of my tops um <laughs> how you doing on, on trauma month well i was happy about this one and i wish we would have just left can can we leave it here can we just leave off here nope <laughs> because next week there's always more such a couple and i know we were watching this one because you <laughs> wouldn't stop talking about it's it it's so c- all these movies are great. Oh, you did so good, honey. That's our puppy again. But anyway, Sergeant Kabuki Man is the shit, and it again has a killer soundtrack. I don't know; these movies have way too good of music <laughs> than what they need. You know what I mean? It's That's insane. Right. But uh, yes, so next week we are watching Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. Probably the furthest away from a horror movie we could possibly get on this show, but it's Trauma Month. All bets are off. (laughs) We cover everything. We may even, next Trauma Month, we may even cover one of the raunchy comedies. I know. But yes, one more with Sergeant Kabuki Man NYPD. So, I know, I'm gonna miss Trauma (laughs) Month. I've had a damn good time. Uh, But, uh, until next time, next week when hopefully our studio puppy is a little less restless well it's her first day here <laughs> it's true it's true uh, hey go go uh adopt dogs man uh a lot of dogs rescue. yeah a lot of rescues and stuff like that if you if you got the the space you got the money uh save one of these pets you know um we saved this dog from euthanasia exactly uh mo- all of our pets are actually rescues yes uh so anyway you know do that uh, why well, they're perfect for when you're fucking quarantined at home? <laughs> so you got yourself a. Companion. I was so depressed, and now it's. I know. Now she's very happy with the puppy. But anyway, until next week, I'm Leah Evans saying, stay spooky. And I'm Brittany. Stay horrific. A uh, bye bye. Bye. Let me. <laughs> Thanks for listening. To get a hold of us and submit your stories, fan mail, and death threats, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and nightofthehorrorfile.com. Our theme song was written and performed by John Brennan. Used with permission. Find John at shopjb.bandcamp.com and at badtechno.com. If you like what you hear, leave a good review wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show on your social media. See you next week.